thanks everyone for being here. Thanks so much to the panelists. Um, just a, a quick introduction to our event first, um, and then I'll have uh, Milan Tambe, the director of, of the um, of circus here at Harvard, um, give a little bit of a welcome as well. So this is our Rising Stars event. It stemmed out of a workshop um, last year that was in person at Harvard. Um, at the beginning of March, that was one of the last things that happened before pandemic life kicked in. Um, so that was the, the last social event essentially that I went to. <laughs> um, and the, so this year, instead of that, um, we're having this Rising Stars um, series featuring four different topics, rising stars in each area um, and various um, applications for sure good. Um, so um, Jackson Killian, Aditya Mate and I have organized, have been organizing the series along with Milland and the circus team. And the way that um, everyone was brought in were through nominations by um, faculty and senior researchers um, in the field of AI for social good who are nominating candidates who they thought were um, senior students and postdocs who were really exemplifying um, ideas in AI for social good. So we're very lucky to hear for, from these four experts in conservation today. Um, and just for those who are just joining now, I will also mention that um, we're live streaming this on YouTube and we'll have a recording available um, publicly afterwards. So can share that as well. And I'll leave it to Milan now. Thank you, Lily. So welcome all to CIRCUS, Harvard Center for Research on Computation and Society, even if virtually. Uh, it is exciting to have host this panel on uh, Rising Stars panel on AI and conservation. My name is Milan Tambe, uh, director of CIRCUS. CIRCUS uh, focuses on use of computation for social impact particularly in topics of public health, conservation, equity, and fairness. And in addition to the projects, we host these events, uh, these Rising Star panels, which we're very proud of, as well as a seminar series uh, and a health equity panel that was held yesterday, another panel. I wanted to thank Lily, uh, Shu, Aditya, Mate, and Jackson Killian for organizing this Rising Star panels. With this, I'm going to hand this back over to Lily to initiate the proceedings. Thank you. All right, thank you all so much. Um, so we're gonna um, jump in um, with our talks today. And I want to say that um, we'll have the four talks go um, all in a row. So please save your questions for the end. We'll have a, um, a 25 minute um, discussion with all the panelists combined. So please, if you have questions that come up, we encourage you to type them into the chat and we'll ask them at the end. Um, so with that, we'll uh, start things off with Elizabeth Bondi, um, who is a PhD student at Harvard University. Um, so she is a PhD candidate studying computer science and has a master's in computer science from the University of Southern California and a bachelor's in imaging science from the Rochester Institute of Technology. At Harvard, she is advised with Professor Milan Tambe and her research includes um, computer vision and systems, especially So uh, Liz, maybe you could go ahead and get going because uh, yes. Liz's video might be, yeah, go ahead. Sounds good. Sorry about that. Thanks, everyone. Let me share my screen. Is it all set? Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you for having me and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you today to discuss uh, the imperfect data that we often encounter in real world domains like conservation and how we can still use it to make decisions. So just to jump right in, pretend that we need to classify animals in photographs for our conservation purposes, and we're given these two close-up images. Uh, so looking at this first image, lots of great research is focused on classifying photos automatically, and it's pretty easy to identify this as a rhino. But this is not always what photos or even other data look like when you're tackling real-world challenges like conservation. Sometimes we might get something that looks a little bit more like this. And I don't know about you, but the first time I saw this, I had absolutely no idea what it showed exactly. 
It turns out um, from our collaborators working together, um, we found out that this is lions, but it's pretty difficult to tell without having some additional context. And even if we figured it out, it's still hard to tell exactly how many are here. So today we're gonna to talk about exactly these types of challenges with data and conservation, specifically collecting limited noisy data to make recommendations. And we must remember that these challenges are present throughout the whole algorithm development and deployment pipeline. And that each step of the pipeline may require different techniques. So the main area of conservation that I've worked on is security in trying to prevent illegal logging, poaching, fishing, and so on. Um, for example, poachers will often place traps in protected areas, which park rangers need to find and remove to protect animals. We may also try to prevent poachers from poaching in real time. My research is primarily focused on using conservation drones to alert park rangers of human activity in protected areas. This takes place when they are closed at night, which happens to be when poaching typically occurs. The conservation drone flies around this protected area and captures thermal images which show heat, like the image we just saw at the beginning. So the imagery is then sent back in real time to a base station where park rangers may monitor it. And then if they see anything suspicious, they could then notify other park rangers to go and investigate further which hopefully could prevent poaching in real time. However, it's a little difficult here to monitor these videos all night and to decide how to allocate drones and respond to detections with limited park rangers, which may depend on knowledge of poaching hotspots. So AI can help alleviate these challenges through automatic detection and reasoning. In fact, this is a pipeline that is widely applicable in AI for conservation. We tend to collect data and automatically interpret this data and then use higher level reasoning algorithms to make recommendations and then deploy. And the cycle of course continues as we may continue to collect more data and so on. In the previous situation, for example, we're collecting and automatically interpreting drone imagery or data and then reasoning about it, how to respond to detections in particular, for example, and then giving the recommendations to park rangers during deployment. However, we already have challenges at the first step in this pipeline, like we talked about. For example, we might have noisy data, limited data. It could be very difficult to collect. It could even be sensitive for some reasons. So as we said earlier, we need to think about this first step throughout the entire pipeline. Um, in the rest of the talk, I'll give some example techniques for doing this in conservation security scenarios we've already discussed, especially focused on using image data from sensors. But there are many open questions throughout each of these areas for many different kinds of data. So we'll start with data in particular and discuss data augmentation and collection. Then we'll go to the reasoning step and think about uncertainty. And we'll conclude by thinking about considering this during deployment. First, going back to our very first example of classification with the elephant and rhino, this likely works well thanks to large label data sets like ImageNet. However, we only have about 62,000 labeled thermal images from our drones, which is pretty limited compared to 14 million that we have in ImageNet. So to get more images without spending time and money collecting or labeling more, we turned to simulation. Here you can see a drone flying around a simulated African savanna, and eventually you can see that we're coming towards some elephants in the distance there. We can use this simulated environment to estimate what a thermal image would look like based on identifying the objects for free because of the simulation and estimating their properties like typical body temperature. We generated 100,000 of these images and use them to increase our mean average precision from 0.438 to 0.459 for animals and humans of multiple sizes. And that's not too bad considering we were able to, again, get this for free because of our simulated environment. So sometimes though, we may just want or need to collect more real data. Maybe synthetic data won't cut it in some cases. 
For example, consider the case where we are trying to predict poaching activity, like placing snares, based on limited data, but we still need to be physically preventing poaching by collecting snares and traps that are placed. In this case, we want to both visit new areas to collect uh, data where poaching may occur, which is exploration, while also still removing snares in areas where we know poaching usually occurs, which is exploitation. So together with lead author Lily Shu, our amazing moderator today, we created the lizard algorithm based on multi-armed bandits to determine a patrolling strategy that could balance these dual goals of collecting data and preventing snare placement. It uses domain characteristics, which I won't get into in much detail today, but include Lipschitz continuity and decomposability of rewards to achieve better performance, both in terms of theoretical no regret and empirical performance on real world data uh, than existing approaches for Lipschitz bandits or combinatorial bandits. So now that we've thought a little bit about collecting data and interpreting it, we can think about using data to make strategic decisions. There are many ways to do this, but we'll focus today on an example in my work using signaling. First of all, what is signaling? Let's say that a drone is flying along, then sees several humans and alerts a ranger who responds to investigate and prevent poaching uh, in the deployment stage. However, what happens if we have few rangers in our very large protected area and our ranger can sometimes be too far away to respond? We may need an alternative deployment method if we still want to prevent poaching. In that case, we may turn the lights on aboard the drone and hopefully lead the poacher suspect to run away, believing that a park ranger is on their way when truly they aren't. Turning the lights on here is called a deceptive signal. So we must be strategic in deceptive signaling. Otherwise, we may risk always signaling when no ranger is able to respond, in which case the signal could even indicate to the poacher that the coast is clear. We can be strategic by planning our signals using a Stackelberg security game. This has been studied in previous work, and the basic idea is that sometimes you should truthfully refrain from turning on the lights when nobody is responding. However, this work assumed perfect detection and therefore didn't signal if there was no detection. As we've already seen, these images can be really difficult and our automatic and even human interpretation of them can sometimes be flawed. So if there is a false negative detection, for example, humans who we accidentally fail to detect, we would not signal and poaching may occur. So we need to acknowledge this uncertainty and modify our strategy accordingly by sometimes signaling even when we don't detect anything. When we do this, now the poacher doesn't know for sure which case they're in if they see a signal. They could have been detected or not, meaning a park ranger could be notified to respond or not, which is an informational advantage uh, for our park rangers. We model this using a Stackelberg security game like in the previous work, but with this additional signaling and informational advantage to account for uncertainty. And in brief, this depends on our resources such as patrollers and drones and on the specific uh, targets, which we capture using a graph. We solve a series of LPs and MIPS to get the exact signaling and allocation probabilities, uh, but I won't go into the details of those today. We then use this to make a recommendation to rangers for where and how to deploy their limited resources. Not only this, but remember that after deployment, this will lead again to further data collection, for example, collecting more drone images as our cycle continues. So it's therefore imperative to remember our uncertainty during this step too. In fact, if we look at this plot of defender expected utility, where the more positive numbers are better, since it means that rangers lose less, we can see that if we ignore uncertainty, we do worse than randomly allocating resources or even not using drones at all. We have to take uncertainty into account in making these recommendations, which we do in our algorithm called guards based on the LPs and MIPS that I mentioned before. Well, I hope you agree this is a potentially useful finding for a deployment, 
it of course still doesn't perfectly capture the real world scenario. For example, we didn't consider drones and humans moving around between nodes in a series of time steps, nor did we consider multiple attackers, and we found that it didn't scale very well to much larger parks. Uh, so lead author Arvind Venugopal and our team therefore created a reinforcement learning algorithm, COMSGPO, to address these weaknesses and still achieve similar performance. So now that we've discussed incorporating data imperfection into our reasoning portion of the pipeline, we're left with deployment, specifically providing rangers with recommendations to then carry out their responses and signals. Uh, humans are the ones who ultimately use the system. So we should involve them in the system. They can help us start by giving us some information about the videos to help with automatic detection. I hope you'll please excuse the somewhat old fashioned GUI here, but it seemed to work pretty well <laughs> in practice. Um, when we detect something, we alert them, optionally with a sound even, and ask them to confirm that we detected something. This allows us to filter out at least some false positives. And then our reasoning algorithm can then give recommendations to rangers for signaling and responding, which again might look something like we saw before, uh, where there's possibly a signal and hopefully uh, preventing poaching in that way. In fact, in more recent work, we've been thinking more about how to involve more stakeholders, both in deployment and throughout the development process uh, by thinking more about participatory design. And we're also looking into ways of using other data sources, particularly when we have limited amounts of data to start with. So I'm very excited to share more of this in the future with all of you. But to reiterate for now, what can we do in AI and conservation to make sure that we strategically collect and process uncertain limited data to make recommendations? We should remember the data throughout the pipeline, for example, with data augmentation and collection, uncertainty and reasoning, and humans in the loop. And we will likely need to use multiple techniques throughout, for example, learning and optimization. Finally, I want to briefly mention TriAI, which is a nonprofit organization that I founded. Our goal is to increase diversity in the field of AI by involving high school and early undergraduate students in AI research applied to real world problems like conservation. We're always looking for mentors and project ideas, so please get in touch with us to learn more and participate. So with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. And again, a big thanks to my amazing collaborators and sponsors and to Circus for hosting me today. Thank you so much. Awesome work, Elizabeth. Thank you so much um, for sharing that your inspiring research um, on really thinking about how AI can help throughout the pipeline from data collection all the way to deployment. Um, so next up, we have Shiva Ayer from New York University. Shiva is a sixth year PhD student in the CS department, um, part of the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences, advised by Professor Lakshmin Arayan Subramanian. And his research interests in computer science lie in the areas of both the network, mobile systems, and data science. He wants to bring these two areas together to design smart systems for urban spatial temporal sensing applications. So with that, you can go ahead, Shiva. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lily. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you to the organizers. Um, so my name is Shiva. I'm a sixth year PhD student, a PhD candidate uh, in computer science at NYU. And uh, in this talk, uh, I'm going to be uh, describing our work in air quality monitoring in Delhi using low cost sensors. Uh, these uh, pictures that you see on the right are some of the uh, low-cost sensors uh, by various manufacturers that we've uh, played around with while walking the streets of Delhi or like, you know, uh, taking auto rickshaws or something. Uh, okay, so uh, why air pollution and why is it bad? I think everyone knows uh, it's bad for, you know, it affects our health, it affects the climate, it affects animals and whatnot. And the problem just keeps getting worse with every year. Um, and it's not just 
the macro level uh, pollution in cities, um, that's a problem. Uh, it's also short term effects that uh, uh, must be uh, noticed. Um, even short term effects, uh, short term exposures for, you know, um, hours at a time, um, or, you know, even minutes at a time sometimes uh, can be uh, pretty hazardous to uh, our health if, uh, you know, they keep repeating over time uh, for a long time. Um, and so this is one motivation for uh, why we want to do fine grain monitoring, uh, because we believe that, you know, uh, existing uh, systems help in like giving us a picture of how bad uh, air pollution the problem is in cities, but then they don't really tell us uh, what like citizens in different parts of the city are going through, you know, who are healthy, who are not, and so on. Uh, how do we measure pollution? Um, you know, there are a bunch of pollutants in the air. Uh, there are many more. Uh, these are some prominent ones. And, uh, you know, you typically measure the concentration of uh, pollutants in the air and, you know, how they vary over time. However, the most important ones that we focus on are uh, is what's called particulate matter. Uh, it stands for PM, and they come in various sizes. Uh, so the fine particulate matter is about 2.5 microns across, and the coarse particulate matter is about 10 microns across. So typically called uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10. Uh, these are the most hazardous because, uh, you know, given their size, as you can see how small they are, uh, they can get deep into our system, into our lungs, into our bloodstream, and, you know, uh, really uh, cause, you know, are one of the reasons for many respiratory diseases and problems today. Um, we are going to be, uh, we have, folk, the, the smaller the particle, the more hazardous it is. And therefore, we have uh, focused uh, firstly on the PM2.5 metric. Uh, and we measure it in metric units, micrograms per meter cube. I mentioned this because, you know, when I show uh, values later on, so you should remember that uh, these are the units, micrograms per cubic meter. Um, okay, why Delhi? Uh, because it's interesting. It's one of the most uh, polluted cities in the world, uh, according to WHO and, you know, people who live there. Um, so uh, it's, uh, what, what do we do about it? The, actually, Delhi, just like many other big cities, has uh, an existing network of uh, sophisticated uh, monitors um, by uh, local government bodies like the Central Pollution Control Board, the Delhi Pollution Control Committee, and so on. Uh, these public monitors are shown in blue in, on the map here. Um, this is the entire greater Delhi area. It's about 900 square kilometers across, uh, pretty big. Uh, we uh, augment this network with a fine grain network that's shown in red. So these are our low cost sensors. We have about 28 of them. And together there are about 60 sensors. Um, the, these monitoring stations by the government are pretty sophisticated and they measure all the pollutants that I mentioned before and many more. Uh, but then they only provide macro level pictures and even the reports by the government usually are only macro level analysis because that's all the data they have. I mean, these monitors are sophisticated, but then uh, they don't really uh, give us the information we want. So uh, that's why our experiment and uh, totally we have about 60 sensors. Now, you know, while fine grain monitoring allows, uh, you know, allows us to actually uh, uncover uh, many interesting uh, things and one of them is hotspots. Uh, so typically when you mention hotspot to somebody, you know, they say, oh, okay, uh, it's a place where pollution is high. Um, but it's, that's kind of vague because it's not just a place. It's also a time when pollution is high. Uh, and it's also, you know, it could be high in space and low in time, low in space, high in time, or it could be a place where pollution just keeps jumping up and down. So, uh, you know, by actually, you know, studying our data, uh, the, the data from our monitors at various locations, at various temporal granularities, you know, average to three hours, half a day, a whole day, and so on, um, we actually see many interesting things. Uh, this is an example of a hotspot at one of our locations, um, you know, which is both high in space and in time. Uh, again, these are all uh, PM 2.5 concentrations. Uh, this is an example of a hotspot that's low in space and low in time. Typically, you know, when uh, when we say hotspot, nobody thinks of uh, low because you know it's only interesting when pollution values are high. But it's not so because when pollution values are low, 
uh, it indicates areas of better air quality. And we notice that these are typically uh, not mentioned in reports and, you know, uh, they're certainly probably taken into account in policy decisions, but then there we have not mentioned, we have not seen mentions of these in reports. Uh, this is an example of a, a hotspot that's low in space, low in time. Uh, this is an example of a hotspot that exhibits a variation that, which we call which we call a jump. So you know it's it's a place where uh, pollution values have just decreased suddenly in a matter of three hours um, by more than uh, by by about 150 micrograms per meter cube, which is a big jump. Uh, and similarly over here, this is an example of a place where it just suddenly jumped uh, within a span of three hours. Uh, Okay, so uh, great. Uh, you know, I hopefully have uh, kind of motivated uh, as to why we need fine grain monitoring and why it can be interesting and uh, so on. Uh, but what we really want to do at the end of the day, what we really want to do is this. Uh, we want to make a, a heat map like this. Um, and we want to make predictions and we want to make predictions that are as accurate as possible. So, um, what do we do for that? We uh, uh, take a do a take a three step approach. Uh, the first step is actually to uh, build a field, which is a baseline interpolation across space and time. Uh, we use a model called the spatiotemporal hierarchical model. Uh, this is a model from geostatistics that's typically used for uh, spatiotemporal modeling, and it's a very flexible model and it's an extension of the popular Kriging model. The Kriging model is typically also used in spatiotemporal modeling. And why do we do this? So unlike our, unlike the uh, monitoring stations by the government, uh, which have, you know, which are very good in the sense that, you know, they don't fail very quickly. And then they report data almost all the time. So they are up, as you can see in the, in this plot here, you know, barely 10% of the monitors show have more than 90% of uh, data available. Uh, in the sense that you know the very few gaps in the data whereas our sensors are you know the, the low cost sensors come with this drawback that you know they're low in cost but then they come with certain drawbacks and one of them is 50 percent of the sensors have 50 percent close to 50 percent uh, gaps in the data so uh you know typically you know approaches that we've seen uh you know employ simple interpolation methods linear interpolation maybe some a little slightly more uh polynomial interpolations but then you know uh, a Kriging uh, we found is a very good uh, way of actually interpolating uh, both over space and time. So it helps to create a baseline field. Uh, it also helps, you know, it, you know, we fill missing values and we are also able to combine other sources of information um, in the model because it's a very flexible model. This model combines, uh, this is, uh, there are four terms in this model, as you can see. There's one which is the Z term, which is the which is a deterministic effects term. You can uh, put in deterministic effects over there, like you know effects of uh, factors that you know exist, and then alpha, which is a uh, sorry B, which is a uh, seasonality effect, X, which is an autoregressive effect, and epsilon, which is the measurement error. Uh, so it also this model also helps take into account error from the measuring device, which is different from process error. Um, so yeah, uh, now using this, and we estimate the parameters here using a maximum likelihood approach, uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, now this helps us create a baseline field, and after this, we predict a we predict PM two point five concentration using what we call a message passing uh, recurrent neural network. Uh, this is basically a recurrent neural network per location where we want to predict with two extra steps, which is a broadcast message and an update message. So, uh, you know, of every location where, where uh, we have a sensor right now is the node in the graph, or, a, or rather every point of interest is a node in the graph. And you could have a sensor there because, you know, if you did, you would have ground truth for uh, building our model. But, you know, this model could be used, you know, one strain could be used in other locations also. Uh, you know, the edges, uh, it's, it's a fully connected graph because, you know, we assume that, you know, there is a uniform diffusion of pollutants in the air, uh, you need, you, you know, um, fully connected, undirected graph. And of course, but the effects of, uh, you know, source pollution sources in neighboring, uh, in neighboring locations kind of, uh, depends on the distance, how far they are. So we have a, a distance, uh, you know, that's, that's the weight in the weight of the edge. 
Uh, now, what do we want to do? So this is a sample, just an illustration. So let's say there are three locations and uh, you know we have an RNN for each, an team for each uh, node. So the first step is, you know, of course, initialize um, the values over there. Um, and then the second step is a broadcast message. So, you know, messages get broadcast from every node, every other node. Uh, and then there is an update step. So where messages are aggregated at each node from all its neighbors and then computed. Both these M and U messaging and update functions are, uh, uh, you know, combination of uh, linear operations. And then finally you have uh, the estimation from the hidden state. So the whole thing is basically a recurrent neural network, but with the additional broadcast and update steps. So in the final step, you have the values at the next time, T plus one. And the last step, is basically uh, now uh, after this step, we have uh, predicted values of PM, which uh, you know, uh, which are pretty good. But even these only serve as a baseline; they don't help us estimate uh, certain uh, more uh, spikes and dips and valleys. So for that, we uh, fit a spline. Uh, over all the locations. So this is kind of like an average spline. It sort of uh, mo models the uh, general trend in you know per day. Uh, we fit one uh, polynomial for every eight hour window in the day. So there's three polynomials and together it's a spline for a day. And uh, we fit it on the residuals. So this epsilon here is the residual from the MPRNN prediction. Uh, the y is the ground truth and y hat is the prediction from the MPRNN. So the spline is uh, fit on the residuals. Great. Now, uh, okay, how are we doing with this uh, model? Uh, it looks like we're doing pretty well because the last one here, MPRNN plus spline, uh, as you can see is about, you know, 10% MAPE. So this is on a six month test win testing window. We, uh, we, uh, our experiment has been going on. It's still going on actually, but we have, we have used data for about two years since uh, mid 2018 uh, till mid 2020 about the start of the pandemic. And 75% uh, of this was uh, used for testing 25% uh, training and then 25% was held out for testing. And this is basically the average performance across all locations uh, during the testing period. Um, so 10% error means about, um, it roughly translates to a similar uh, scale of uh, PM 2.5 concentration, about 10 to 15 micrograms per meter cube, which we think is pretty impressive given that, you know, uh, pollution value, you know, PM values in Delhi can reach as high as even thousand in the winters. And the yearly average is typically 200, 300, which is like several times higher than uh, what the WHO, you know, needs us to maintain. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, we, we compare this with like some uh, some of the other methods here. Uh, KNN is a is a more simplistic uh, neural network approach, which does not have the message passing um, um, operations, and the STHM is the hierarchical model that I mentioned. Um, what about in space? Um, there are some locations where, uh, you know, we have a uh, slightly poorer performance, but for the most part, I think we are doing pretty well. Uh, our sensors are mostly concentrated in the South Delhi and New Delhi region, on, as you can see on the right. I've zoomed in there, so in order to show what our performance is over there. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, you know, appropriate response to this polio problem, you know, requires uh, better monitoring and data analysis techniques. Um, it's important because, uh, you know, air pollution is a problem. Fine grain monitoring adds value because, you know, it helps us discover hotspots and also peaks and valleys and helps us build pollution heat maps, which ultimately we believe, uh, you know, will be useful in policy making as it should, uh, which is what we hope. Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, finally, uh, by combining uh, state of the art geostatistical and machine learning methods, we are able to make pretty well, pretty good predictions of PM 2.5 concentration. And we believe this can be extended to any other pollutants also. Uh, thanks to all my collaborators uh, at NYU and uh, also at EPOD India at IFMR lead in Delhi, which is where this project started. 
and uh, also Kaitara, the sensor company with which with whom we have collaborated for our deployment. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Shiva, for your really cool work um, that really shows a close understanding of these domain problems and what's going on on the ground, as well as um, what machine learning techniques are needed to solve it. Next up, we have Sasha Lucioni from um, the Mila Institute. So Sasha is a postdoctoral researcher working on artificial intelligence for humanity initiatives at Mila, where she leads projects at the nexus of machine learning and social issues such as climate change, education, and healthcare. Sasha got her PhD in cognitive computing from UQAM in 2018, and then spent two years working in applied machine learning research and she's um, organized and led many AI for social good initiatives, um, including um, the climate change AI. So off to you, Sasha. Thank you. Um, thank you for the great introduction. Um, so the title of my talk is Visualizing the Future Impacts of Climate Change with uh, Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. So um, the issue uh, behind this project, so I'll try to bring you through the story of the project and not uh, skip straight to the results, just to give you an idea of um, what a journey this has been. So this has been my, my postdoctoral project for the last two years. So um, it's almost it's almost culminated, it's almost done. So I wanted to give you a, kind of a walkthrough of how it started and where it's going. Um, so the issue that we're, we're tackling is that climate change um, is, is a hard, is an issue around which it's hard to mobilize collective action, right? This has been on, most people's radars uh, for for decades, um, you know, since sometimes the 60s and 70s, it's been kind of gathering momentum. And despite this, um, the status quo continues, both um, kind of on a government level, or it's going too slow in any case, um, and on, on an individual level. So um, I guess there's there's not a single solution um, to climate change, far from it. Uh, but uh, individuals are are a really really big part of um, of the solution, and essentially it's going to take a multitude, right? Uh, a, lar a large quantity of small solutions, of small actions um, in order to, to move the needle. And um, there has been a lot of research about uh, communicating around climate change. So uh, once again, this is a, a really interesting field of, of study and researchers have been doing experiments to figure out what do people respond to? And they found that, you know, uh, doomsday messaging kind of saying that, you know, we're all gonna die is probably not a good idea. Uh, degrees of uh, warming or kind of percentages and risk factors, things like this, um, also doesn't tend to help because people don't know what 4.5 degrees is or 1.5 degrees. Um, they also showed that images of uh, the ice caps or polar bears on ice caps or, um, you know, flooding in the Maldives has not uh, helped either because people tend to say, oh, this is too far away from me. This is not my problem. Who cares about the polar bears? Um, and so, you know, there's there, but there has been some things that kind of have been learned along the way. And so uh, two, two kind of aspects of messaging that have come out of uh, on a high level from this research is that emotionally charged messages work better than kind of like purely scientific ones. So like IPCC reports are not necessarily going to be super, <laughs> uh, super actionable, but, um, you know, converting that into, well, this means that, um, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to travel to the places you like, or you're not going to be able to eat the food or the food that you, you like is going to be more expensive, avocados are going to disappear, things like that, that tends to help. And also personally relevant messages. So as I said, polar bears and ice caps are one thing, but people respond to messaging that talks about them and their livelihood and their kind of, um, you know, their, their perception of the world. And so, and images in particular are, are a key part of it. So once again, like these reports with these figures and these numbers tend to kind of go over people's heads um, and images tend to be uh, particularly um, communicative. And so the aim of the project that I'm working on is uh, to use GANs or generative adversarial networks to generate these images that are emotionally charged, personally relevant, and to display them in a website where, where people can learn about climate change and learn about action and kind of, um, and get these images. And so um, I'm sure, hopefully you are all familiar with, with generative adversarial networks or GANs. They've been around for uh, since 2014, I think now. Um, and they've gotten really, really good, right? Uh, for better or for worse, uh, it's kind of become a problem, but they're, they're gotten good and you know, uh, they can synthesize people that don't exist. And a particular type of GAN called PsychoGAN came out a few years ago. And uh, the specialty or the, the kind of um, the defining feature of PsychoGAN is that you could take two 
groups of images, uh, so zebras and horses or uh, photographs and Monet paintings that were not at all of the same things. I mean, like not of the same places, um, so not aligned uh, in technical terms. And um, Psychogan could learn to transform uh, a new uh, picture that it hasn't seen before, a new image, like a new horse into a zebra. And uh, this could be done the same for, you know, transforming photographs into Monet, impressionist paintings and winter to summer and things like that. And so the idea was, what if we could use this technology in order to transform places, normal places, people, places that um, ha haven't been touched by climate change into ones that have. Turns out to be not as easy as we thought. So uh, these were the initial results of this project uh, in early 2019, so, so two years ago. Um, we took some images of Montreal, we took some images of flooded places. Um, so yeah, we started with floods as, as a first um, extreme weather event and we ended up spending almost uh, a year and a half on it. It turned out to be a lot more complicated than we thought. Um, and so these images, um, what we saw is that the cycle again is really destructive. Um, so it's, it kind of destroys the whole image. Uh, it will, you know, make a house look like it's not only flooded, but kind of dilapidated or uh, kind of decaying, which can be useful, but not necessarily what we were looking for. And also that it would uh, change the color of the sky, change the color of, uh, of buildings and things like that. So um, we spent uh, several months trying to make CycleGAN work. Um, and then finally we realized that this is too destructive. We need another approach. Um, and specifically for floods, what's interesting is that they only impact a certain part of the image, right? Uh, once you think about it, if you take a step back, uh, you're not gonna be flooding the sky, you're gonna be flooding the ground. And so we decided to uh, try another approach, uh, another type of GAN that would do this kind of um, separation, right? A separation of, of different elements of the image. And so um, we tried Instagram. Uh, and what, what's interesting about Instagram is that you can give it a mask. And so essentially figure out where, uh, where you want the water to go, uh, which we did with kind of automatic semantic segmentation algorithms. And then you could constrain the transformation to that particular uh, area of the image. And as you can see, it does fairly well. Um, and uh, actually it even does reflections and even kind of does contextual elements. That was pretty cool. Uh, but what we realized is that um, we don't have enough data to train this. Um, and also that these kinds of floods are only gonna be like very light, almost kind of just like flooding a little bit on the ground. And what we want is kind of to show floods that are life-changing and that are happening across the world where people need to uh, you know, evacuate their home, evacuate their city because uh, they can't even access it because of all the water. Uh, and in any case, we hit a, a data wall, so kind of like what Liz was explaining um, at a certain point, we just didn't have enough first person images of floods. And so um, uh, true to form, we decided to create a virtual world. We put the kind of the GAN part of the project on hold and we spent uh, a good six months um, trying to create um, a realistic virtual world using Unity uh, where you can zoom in. And essentially the idea is um, because aerial images of floods are more common. So, I mean, this is a bad example, I guess, but um, what we really wanted is a first person image. Imagine you were standing on a flooded street kind of thing. And those images are very uh, infrequent because typically people don't stick around when <laughs> their street is flooded, they'll, uh, they'll try to leave. And um, the flooded images that we did find would be by, for example, news agencies. And in, in any case, that'd be limited in, in quantity. So essentially we created this uh, virtual world that has um, a downtown, it has uh, suburbs, it has uh, kind of semi-residential places, it has a little forest and stuff like that. And what was interesting is that um, we could of course control all the elements, add cars, add um, you know, garbage cans and, and whatnot. And we could also flood to the level that we wanted. And so we spent actually a lot of time trying to figure out how to make the water uh, the good texture um, because flooded are, you know, they don't look like pools. They don't look like kind of nice uh, clean water. They kind of look like dirty water. So, you know, we spent a, a quite a long time trying to create this virtual world. And um, finally, when we did, um, we uh, took, you know, a couple of thousand images of different angles, different levels of flooding, different uh, elements, different houses, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we endeavored to do domain adaptation because the idea is, is that you know, there is a difference in these two different sources of data, right? On one hand, we have a lot of images that are synthetic um, and we actually have masks. So we have like flooding masks uh, of the water. We have semantic segmentation masks of buildings and sky and trees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, but we don't have like uh, exact pairs, right? We don't have a pair of synthetic uh, versus and real. We don't have the same place essentially in a virtual world and in the real world. So um, 
we had to figure out a way of doing domain adaptation. Um, once again, unaligned uh, domain adaptation. So um, in order to figure out, uh, essentially we use the semantic maps uh, as, a, as a way of, of matching up, you know, cars in both worlds, buildings in both worlds, skies in both worlds, water in both worlds. And we integrated this um, into our eventual uh, GAN uh, architecture as one of the components. So essentially now the approach that we ended up settling on uses both of these sources of data uh, in order to leverage uh, both kind of like the real world elements and the, the, the simulated data in order to um, in synthesize images uh, of climate change. And so um, our climate GAN architecture um, actually ends up separating the task in two parts. So we, we um, after you know, months of, of, of trying different approaches, we figured out that actually having two steps in our procedure um, makes them work better separately. And so the first task uh, kind of on a high level takes, um, so I, I guess in pink you can see um, simulated data or, and real data and encodes them into the same space. And essentially that's the, the domain adaptation part, right? You wanna make sure that they're um, kind of projected in the same latent, latent space. And then we have uh, masks. So from the real world, uh, sorry, from the simulated data, we have the kind of the ground truth because we can, we can generate it based on the, because it's, you know, we're, we're controlling the world. And for the, for the real data, we used um, kind of a modified version of, uh, of semantic segmentation um, algorithms. And so essentially uh, trained on cityscapes and we merged some classes in order to have like a kind of a simpler, uh, a simpler uh, mask. And then uh, kind of we use uh, this encoded version um, and we have again architecture, you know, that we train in order to um, uh, distinguish essentially to make uh, generated images as real as possible. So here we have uh, the GAN. And then finally, um, the, so the output of this is, um, is gonna be a mask. So this just tells kind of uh, based on this input image, um, this is where the water should go in, in this image. And we have a second um, uh, network, second neural network that will take this mask. So it's just kind of a, a gray mask and um, using co convolutional neural, ne uh, neural networks. Uh, so CNN layers within it. It's gonna um, use uh, paint water and the water is also gonna be contextual. And so what we're using is kind of um, based on spade, which is a, is, is a, um, a GAN approach that can kind of uh, use context in order to represent uh, different classes. So based on this mask, so we uh, generate contextual water. So it's gonna uh, reflect buildings, it's gonna reflect sky, it's gonna change color, et cetera. So finally we have this two-step approach. And um, it does really well. So all of these um, images are from the test set. So the algorithm hasn't seen it before and it's gonna flood, uh, it's gonna uh, create reflections. It's gonna flood around a meter high. That's what we're aiming for uh, to kind of represent extreme flooding. It's gonna flood around uh, objects uh, such as cars as well. So this is like a street in downtown Montreal. As you can see, it, it actually, you know kind of figures out how to make cars look like they're um, flooded. Um, we also added two other events that ended up being a lot easier than floods, only took us a, a few months. So we have uh, smog, actually, very uh, apropos, um, to represent kind of uh, polluted cities. And so people can see, this is once again, downtown Montreal, what their favorite street would look like if it was uh, clogged with smog. Um, same thing with New York, right? It's kind of uh, seeing what would happen if, if it got worse and worse. Um, and the third event is wildfires. And um, these were actually, we did the, we, we got a lot of training data after the sadly after the California wildfires and um, it's kind of a mix of um, red and orange filters uh, that are kind of randomly generated and um, masking out the sky with a Gaussian blur in order to represent also this kind of smoky and hazy um, atmosphere. And so at first we were thinking of like setting houses on fire and then we realized no this is what wildfires look like uh, in, in a lot of cases it's, it's somewhere nearby like the forest nearby is burning and this is what actual cities will look like um, nearby. And so we're currently working on the website. Uh, it's going to be this climate does not exist um, as like the again, again, joke. I hope you, this person does not exist. This cat does not exist. This climate does not exist. And so the idea is to say, well, these are not real images. Uh, this is not necessarily going to happen on your street or in your neighborhood, but this is happening in, in a lot of places. And so I didn't have the, the time to do the interactive version, but essentially these are going to actually portray real floods like flooding in, um, in Australia, wildfires in California or Siberia. And so the idea is to make the link, like this is not happening. Your house is not on fire, but the planet is on fire and the planet is getting flooded. And so we're gonna have um, a lot of kind of uh, educational resources for people to learn like why floods are happening, why wildfires are getting worse, and then um, actions that people can take and kind of 
specific things that they can do in order to um, mitigate uh, their climate impact. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sasha. It's really cool to think about the emotional and human and educational side of things, as well as the action that needs to be taken on the ground. So last up um, for our presentations today, we have Esther Rofe from UC Berkeley. So Esther is a fifth year PhD candidate in the computer science department, um, advised by Mike Jordan and Ben Recht. Esther studies how data acquisition processes and downstream use cases influence the efficacy and applicability of machine learning systems with an emphasis on problems with the potential for positive social impact. And her projects span developing algorithms and infrastructure for reliable environmental modeling, monitoring and understanding social outcomes of decisions influenced by machine learning systems. So please go ahead, Esther. Uh, thanks, Lily, for that introduction. Go ahead and share my screen. All right, so let me know if um, you're having trouble seeing the screen, otherwise I'll go ahead. Um, so I'm Esther, I'm very excited to be talking to you today about my work on a generalizable and accessible approach to machine learning with global satellite imagery. So this project is really motivated by a vast potential for combining satellite imagery and machine learning, which I'll abbreviate throughout the talk as SIML, toward helping researchers monitor our world across multiple domains. From uh, mapping poverty where national censuses are sparse, uh, to detecting and monitoring wildlife like we saw in Liz's talk, um, to monitoring ecological phenomena such as deforestation. And I've oriented these three examples in terms of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals just to show you the, the real variety and tasks um, in prediction domains that can take use of SIML as a technology. However, even though each of these three examples I just showed you and kind of hundreds of more behind the scenes I don't have time to go through, this relying on translating basically the same sources and sets of satellite imagery into relevant statistics for each of these domains, this process is currently uh, very costly, both in terms of computation and just storage of the imagery itself, as well as, at this point, requiring a, a pretty high level of machine learning expertise to make this work. And as a result, most of the solutions in any of these specific contexts is very domain specific, even though we're using basically the same underlying satellite imagery. So when we went to design a symbol methodology, which we call mosaics, we're designing explicitly for accessibility. So this idea that a non-machine learning researcher uh, can use the expertise in their field to innovate on and use SIML methodology without the machine learning being the main research focus. We'll, um, we'll achieve this through an algorithmic simplicity that really asks, where do we need to incorporate the heavy statistical tools and the heavy computational tools? And we'll see that this also brings about a generalizability of the solution. So leveraging this idea that it's the same underlying satellite imagery that's being used across these domains, can we actually use basically the same transformation of that satellite imagery to be applicable across multiple prediction tasks? And of course, we wanna be able to achieve these three goals without really sacrificing the accuracy or applicability of our system toward any of these um, individual tasks. So at a high level, this is what the mosaic system looks like. And let me first orient you to this yellow box on the left, which is all about the unsupervised featureization step. So we're converting each of these satellite images into a, a statistical summary, a vector or a row of this feature matrix, um, where that summary is actually much more useful for downstream prediction tasks, such as these regression tasks you see here, than the, um, the structural pixel representation on the very far left, which is much more visible to our human eye, these X vectors are much more useful for the prediction. And so the key thing to take away from this figure is once we've um, created this X matrix, the feature embedding, is that same feature embedding that can get sent to one research team studying forest cover 
And the same X matrix can be sent to a team studying population density. And immediately we see this uh, potential for parallelization across research domains. You see a little bit on the far right of our comparison of our predictions to ground truth data. Um, I'm going to get back to that in just a second, but I want to give you a little more, more detail on what this unsupervised featureization is all about. So we're using random convolutional features. So if you're familiar with CNNs or um, convolutional neural networks, you'll see a lot of the same computational elements here, a convolution, a ReLU nonlinearity, and then a summation over pixels. Uh, in contrast to most CNNs, this is a very shallow network. It's really just one step. Um, and rather than optimizing over the weights and biases within this network, we're using a random initialization and we're relying on the width of this network, so a large number of random filters to um, achieve expressivity. So once we have this feature matrix X created, the prediction step just relies on basically geographically matching labels to features and then running a ridge regression, which is this optimization problem on the right here. And the important thing to note here is all of these arrows are feeding forward to, or toward the optimization problem. So if um, a new researcher comes to me and says, well, forestation, or sorry, forest cover deforestation is great to study, uh, population density is great, but what I really care about is um, household income. If they have that data set of whys already available, we can match it with the feature matrix and never actually have to go back to the imagery itself. If you contrast this with uh, fine-tuned CNNs, you're not only optimizing over the weights in that regression in the last layer of the network, you're also optimizing on all of the model weights that are internal to the network itself. So we have the, um, kind of broken this independence and now every time uh, you introduce a new label, you are going back to the imagery. So what you get out of this is a much more expressive model um, but you're paying a computational cost in that expressivity every time you have to retrain the model. So the question is, is that really worth it? And so when we put mosaics, our system head to head with a fine tuned ResNet 18, and this is across seven different prediction tasks in the US, uh, we're seeing a pretty similar accuracy across tasks between these two methods. In general, Mosaics is a little bit uh, behind the Resna 18 in terms of accuracy, um, but from the previous slide, we'd expect that. What, where we're really seeing gains is in the difference in training times between these methods. So each of these green bars for Mosaics took about seven and a half minutes on a CPU machine, and then we're doing the full cross-validation over the ridge regression hyperparameter there. In contrast to about eight hours for each of these blue bars, and that's just for one hyperparameter setting after we had already done the um, hyperparameter search. And this is also on a pretty heavy duty Amazon instance with the GPU. So this is a fairly conservative um, time comparison, but I think you get the point that Mosaics is uh, much faster here. Uh, so a very natural question at this point is how are we getting even close to, accurate, uh, close to similar accuracy between Mosaics and the ResNet 18? Uh, let me offer you this explanation. So satellite images have a lot of structure such as scale and orientation invariances that come from the sensor model and the pre-processing steps in creating this imagery before we even put it into the futurization pipeline. And this is in contrast to a lot of natural imagery, like these two images of red pandas from the ImageNet data set. And so it's the structure in satellite imagery that can help explain why performance of simpler methods like random convolutional features which are basically just taking local texture information within the image, how that could come close to the performance of more complex methods like a fine-tuned CNN. Okay, so now I wanna get a little more into the performance of the mosaics predictions themselves. So here you see on the left, the ground truth labels of forest cover across the US, and then the mosaics predictions on a holdout validation set. Um, so this is for forest cover. We're explaining roughly 90% of the variation in the labels with our predictions. 
Uh, here is predictions for population density and per household income. And when we put all seven of the tasks we study in the US on the same slide, it becomes a little hard to look at the actual maps, but what we see is an ability to compare performance and actually structure in the errors as well across these seven outcomes. So we can start to ask questions like, which of these variables can we predict from space with high fidelity? And we're comparing these seven tasks on essentially the same exact um, summarization of the imagery and prediction pipeline. So where labels are available, we also predict globally. So here's our global labels and predictions for forest cover, for population density, for nighttime lights, and for elevation. And I want to highlight as well that when we talk about mosaics being really fast to retrain, that eight minutes versus eight hours slide, uh, we're also talking about an ability and an incentivization to look beyond just the accuracy numbers and the maps I showed you on the previous slides toward developing and conducting kind of context dependent analyses of similar technology. Uh, and here's one example that I show you. So in this plot, we're looking at how performance changes as we change the amount of spatial extrapolation in the learning problem. So as you see on the bottom here, we're splitting the training data and the validation data into geographically disjoint sets. And as we increase this parameter delta, we're essentially making everything in our validation sets further from the training data, further in space. So we're essentially making the extrapolation problem more severe, and so we're thinking performance should be degrading. And we see this, the accuracy for forest cover is going down a little bit as delta increases, but we're fairly robust to that extrapolation. Whereas when we compare to the remaining six tasks, we see some, some prediction domains like elevation and per household income are really greatly affected by this extrapolation. And this is a really important thing to know, kind of which of these contexts are you in? because a very common use case of symbol technology is to build and train a, meth, um, train a model in a location where you have a lot of ground truth data, and then you want to apply that to a location where data is sparse. So you really wanna know kind of which of these regimes are you in. I'd like to highlight also our work toward making this uh, system really quite accessible. Uh, it's in sandbox mode now, but you can see we're developing a public API where future users can query directly for features and uh, run their own scientific analyses and contextual uh, sensitivity tests like in the previous slide. So returning to our design goals, uh, Mosaics from the outset is designed to be accessible, simple, and generalizable. And we're hoping that this enables future work both in context-dependent analyses and developing kind of new sensitivity tests of how symbol can be validated and used, as well as advances from the machine learning perspective. And I'd argue that kind of both of these in parallel and together are needed toward developing a real context dependent symbol methodology, where we're thinking critically about where the heavy duty statistics and where the heavy duty computation comes into this entire holistic pipeline so that we're making predictions um, that are actually very effective and useful for downstream policy and, and other tasks there. Let me just really briefly uh, flash these references for anyone who's interested or watching the talk later. And now I'll uh, stop my share. Thanks so much, Esther, for your work on scalability in, um, in learning both in terms of computational speed up, which a lot of people commented on in the chat, um, but then also thinking about scaling this for satellite imagery problems across the globe. Um, so now we'll, we'll move to a Q&A with the panelists. And um, we have some questions that came up in the chat, but please, I can jump on to, to add more. Uh, but one thing we'll just start with um, before going to the audience questions is a question um, for all of you, which is just what is one important lesson that you've learned in AI for social good work, um, broadly interpreted? So let's we can just go in, in order. So we'll start with Liz. All right. Thank you so much. 
Um, yeah, so I spoke a lot about data throughout my talk, and I agree it can take a surprisingly long time to handle some of these. For example, I related a lot when Sasha mentioned how things were more difficult than expected, and it took months to build a simulator, for example. But I think collaborators are also key throughout the entire pipeline. Um, we worked with Air Shepherd to understand and label the data and the domain, to understand how and if they've done signaling and what a full system should look like. And in the Lizard project, the whole idea behind needing a dual mandate patrol instead of just gathering information came from discussions between Lily and our collaborators in the parks. Um, so in my upcoming work, I'm really looking forward to even more collaborations with domain experts and other stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. Um, thank you, uh, Lily and all the organizers. Um, I would I would kind of second what uh, Elizabeth said. It's 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 essentially uh, what I find is the, is the most important thing about uh, doing social good is to actually collaborate with people who are in completely different uh, disciplines. Uh, so this work work wouldn't have been possible without collaborations with um, you know sensor manufacturers, electrical engineers, and uh, policy analysts and statisticians, and you know so many different diverse fields and. Uh, and, and, you know, when it comes to policy, that's a whole different thing. You know, they don't, they, 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 they do math, but then they don't really understand CS. So uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a marriage of, uh, you know, so it's a multi-way marriage of so many different fields. And, you know, I think uh, effective collaborations and, uh, and, and collaborations are a must. And, and, you know, I think effective collaborations can bring out good uh, work. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to, to, to build on what was said before. And um, I think learning to speak uh, other languages is really important. Like something I've been actively working on in the last two years is how to explain my work in ways that people understand it. And I think that, I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree that working with partners is important. And, and exactly this is why learning how to talk about what you're doing in a way that's not kind of um, techno saviorism and like AI is gonna solve this, everyone step back. Uh, which is apparently um, the um, the reputation that machine learning has gotten from a lot of disciplines uh, uh, is that like we, we come along and we're like hey yeah step back we're gonna use some neural network uh, which is obviously not not the way that um, that we want to work right and so um, yeah humble humble and, and and translational experience is really useful. Great. So uh, I agree with everything that was said so far, and I feel like it actually kind of like summarizes what I was going to say quite nicely. Um, maybe if I can talk about it more from like a, a personal perspective of how you as a researcher go into this work, I definitely learned to kind of nix that saviorism uh, <laughs> viewpoint from the outset. It's very tempting for me as a machine learning AI researcher to come in and say, oh, what is your problem? As long as we formulate it the right way, I can put algorithm improvements, I can tune the loss function, I can, I can make it better for you. Um, but coming from a perspective of actually really listening to what the collaborators I'm working with are saying and what they need, um, that was one way that we actually were able to say, well, maybe what we need is not an algorithmic improvement, maybe we kind of need to go back to basics a little bit so that we can make improvements in other elements of the system. Um, and so that ability to kind of listen, translate different languages and really like use everyone's expertise has been uh, a really valuable um, skill building thing for me. I guess one immediate question building off of that to Sasha and others please chime in is how have you learned to um, communicate in these other languages or non-technical jargon like everyone always talks about that as an important skill but how is that something that you acquire so I've been actually trying to um, read uh, articles and and actually work with um, people who are kind of in in the middle like for example people in climate informatics uh, people who are you know in computational sustainability things like that and I feel that they've already been kind of standing um bridging the gap for a while and so it's a good place to start and then when you start you know being more or less familiar then you can really go on and, and like 
read read literature on your own but it's true that at the beginning when you're reading these papers like even ipcc reports you're like what what is this what is going on right um so there is like a learning curve but um but i, I prefer to work with people and i find that you know asking questions is my way of learning for other people it will be like just just reading our articles or watching youtube videos or whatever so i think it depends on your modality Um, I, I didn't have a problem with languages, thankfully, uh, but, I, but I do completely agree uh, that, you know, it's important for languages, although for me personally, the place where I worked, I mean, it was not too hard to manage with language because I, I was familiar with the local language, but I do uh, think that, um, uh, you know, communicating with people uh, is, is, you know, is very important. So. Uh, one one thing that I think would help uh, uh, in in my experience is is uh, you know bringing in one of the things that you bring in as a PhD student or a scholar or a senior or a, an experienced researcher who uh, is that you know you not only actually work on the technical part of the problem but you also break it down for other people to do their part. So you know when you give people things that they actually understand and you know uh, so they're able to do their part. You are, and, and you know you take up the task of actually putting things together um, that's uh, that's that's a contribution in itself and you know this ability to split and then put things together uh, give people what they want what they what they understand that that's uh, really good. yeah so to add to Shiva and Sasha's points I, I think it's also important to find uh, projects or ideas that are kind of incentivized by everyone in your group. Uh, so that everyone kind of has this natural incentive to figure out what is that person saying when they mean uh, regression coefficients, like even what you call the regression coefficient changes between machine learning and econ, and I never would have thought that going into this project. There's all these little things like that, where if you see kind of a common direction emerging, then bridging that is actually just part of the process of getting there for everyone. Um, and it's not always apparent how that mutual incentive comes about. And so there's often a lot of zigzagging and things like that. And a lot of patience, I'd say, is needed. Thank you so much. Um, let's go through some of the questions from the chat. So first to Liz, um, I'll, I'll ask you just two questions simultaneously. So the first from Subash. Um, can we classify human and animal thermal temperature by captured signal? And the second question from Shiva um, is, where did you deploy these systems and where is your data from? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, I would say in terms of humans versus animals, I'm interpreting the question to mean, can we just look up their temperatures and then determine you know, if they're an animal or a human? Um, so based on our research that we did when building our simulator, we found that human and animal temperatures are very, very similar. Um, so for example, I have these in Calvin. So apologies, you might have to go with do a conversion quickly. Um, but like humans are 292 Calvin or so, uh, where elephants are about 290 and zebra are about 298, rhinos are 291. So we're all really, really close in there. Um, so I would say it's pretty difficult to just directly use uh, temperature. And it's even more difficult because the types of sensors that we use on the drones, um, they're called microbolometers usually. They're a little bit, they're not usually cooled. So you usually have a pretty difficult time keeping them calibrated. So to be able to get the exact temperature at all time points while you're flying would be pretty difficult. Um, so in general, we've been looking at things like shape and we also do look for some contrast between like the, the animals and humans versus the background uh, to find them because there is a pretty significant temperature difference there. So we're looking more at relative differences, I would say. Um, and then in terms of deployment, uh, so we field tested and briefly deployed uh, the, the detection algorithm in South Africa. Um, and then we used data from multiple countries in Southern Africa, such as South Africa, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. Um, so lots of different places in there and hopefully we can continue in the future. Thank you for the great question. Okay, um, and a question from Shiva um, through a private message um, asks, what are the intervention tools policymakers can use based on these predictions of air quality that you have? 
I'm sorry, that was to me. Okay, can you repeat that? Yes, um, what are the intervention tools that policymakers can use um, based on the predictions you make? Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, okay, so first thing is, uh, you know, you go there and find out what are the sources that are causing pollution. Uh, so, you know, uh, by actually, what, 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 one thing that I couldn't uh, mention in the talk was that, you know, by actually studying these different types of hotspots, uh, different types of incidents, uh, you know, high and low and, you know, combination of highs and lows and variations and so on, these jumps. So by actually, uh, you know, sort of uh, looking at all of these at a particular location, uh, you know, we can sort of uh, get a, or, and looking at the distribution of, you know, the occurrences of such different incidents. You know, we have a finite uh, number of such incidents and by looking at those, you know, we can sort of build a distribution a profile. And with that, we would uh, get up, you know, and if, and if, you know, with, with that in mind, uh, if we look at uh, sources that are uh, causing uh, problems over there in the, you know, in that region, and we uh, also look at other places similarly. Uh, so we might actually be able to map these two like sources. So the next intervention step would be immediately, uh, you know, sources. And uh, then, uh, I'm sorry, I digressed a bit over there, but then uh, uh, finding sources and then basically, you know, trying to mitigate sources. And also like, you know, if uh, depending on what types of incidents are occurring over there, uh, you wanna, uh, you know, you know, help people, you know, bring in local restrictions or regulations. Uh, you know, you wanna curb traffic at a particular spot where there's a high concentration of, uh, you know, there's a high contribution by traffic to the low, to the air pollution at that location. So things like that. Thank you for the question. Awesome. So for Sasha, um, there are two questions that are asked simultaneously. So the first from Raul is, um, do you predict when this will happen? And the second from um, Shiva is how re realistic are these? So for example, is it actually possible for the Eiffel Tower to get flooded like that? So um, with regards to the first question, we are, I mean, it's actually really, really hard to predict extreme climate events. Um, and so we're taking climate models uh, on, a, on a global scale and saying, for example, floods are becoming, you know, X percent more um, likely. But the thing is, depending on where you live, for example, to take floods, in some cases, it's going to be uh, coastal flooding. In other cases, like here in Montreal, we've had flooding because of ice melt because, you know, it got warm all of a sudden and a lot of snow melted uh, in one go. And these are like really, really hard to predict because it's not essentially flooding that you're predicting. It's the temperature, which is linked to flooding, right? And so it's, uh, we spent actually a while talking about this uh, with climate experts. And then they said, it's just not doable. Like we're, we're kind of like, and also there's so many, um, so many things that can happen. There's like um, feedback loops that can happen, right? And so Currently, we're, we're just trying to get people to understand that, you know, these are, events are happening more frequently on a global scale. And in terms of realism, um, I guess the idea is not necessarily to be uh, geographically realistic, but uh, to, to um, stimulate empathy. So it's, um, it's not like about, yeah, the Eiffel Tower is probably in a place that won't easily get flooded, but um, there are places that are getting flooded. And so it's, it's really like to help people, you know, uh, make the abstract concrete, even when that uh, concrete is not, um, is not realistic. And of course, people who live on, a, on top of a hill, uh, on top of a mountain are never gonna get flooded. And that's kind of not the point. The point is more, uh, is more awareness raising. I think it'd be pretty cool if you could somehow have like geo tags in the photos. Um, so when people upload something, then you could estimate what the relative risk of sea level flooding is. Like on coastal cities, surely it'd be more, and then other places it'd be less. Yeah, we're actually linking to like there are uh, there are sites that do this. Like you can actually like zoom in on where you live. Um, but people have done it so well, we don't want to kind of reinvent it. <laughs> Sure. Okay. So um, a question for everyone um, from Milland is um, I wanted to hear um, about your publication strategies. So you're engaged in interdisciplinary work. So do you end up publishing in primarily AI venues? Um, and would it help to have more venues to publish AI for social impact work? And let's start with Esther. Uh, I think that's a wonderful question. I think we've probably all gotten reviews that are of the type uh, I'm an expert in X, but I'm not an expert in Y, and you're combining these, so I don't know how to assess this work. Um, and that can be very frustrating, because if you're between X and Y, you really want a reviewer and a community that kind of does have experts in each. Um, so like broadly throughout my PhD, I've published uh, like in machine learning conferences like ICML, but also in kind of journals in other fields like robotics and such. And 
I found that to be very specific on the project for what makes sense. Um, I will say for people who are like interested and inspired, there are some really good workshops at like ICML and NeurIPS and that's kind of a more targeted community of people who care about both of these spaces. But as that community becomes bigger, I think there is a strong value in adding um, more venues where it's specifically focused on AI and conservation together so that the, it's not just one or the other that's getting kind of evaluated and praised by that community, but it's really both of these in tandem. Yeah, and just to, to continue on that, um, there are like there, there are workshops um, and there's also tracks, for example, this year at ACL, there was a specific track in the main conference for, for social good. But um, I think that there's still a problem of, I mean, I guess this is, it is a problem, quote unquote, for a lot of multidisciplinary um, work in, in, in different fields is that there are not necessarily uh, enough, for example, people, as you say, that are, 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 can be reviewers, but also like the criteria is hard to define, right? Um, you know, I guess typically in machine learning, it's some kind of state of the art or whatever. But even if you want to go above and beyond that, like as a reviewer, you can learn about, for example, I'll learn about conservation uh, and poaching. But like, what, what, how do I say that if this is a good paper or not, like more broadly speaking, and I think that it would be useful to have more kind of yeah, I guess like more meta uh, meta discussions about like, what are we trying to go towards as a field of, of AI for social good? Like, what are we aiming towards? Um, and like, what do we want to highlight in our work? Um, so I see that Raul has um, their hand raised. Raul, would you like to unmute? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much again for excellent uh, presentation by everybody. I mean, this is amazing. I have two questions and my questions um, um, are just basic. Um, so <laughs> I still, I'll still go ahead and ask them. One is for Shiva is uh, when these sensors are uh, deployed, uh, are these, how do you pick a location of like, this is where we want to uh, connect our sensor? Uh, how, how do you make up that decision? Is it from just uh, by experience, you know that this place, place is crowded, we see a lot of traffic in this area, we've heard a lot of pollution and let's go ahead and deploy a sensor, is that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, do, do, do you wanna ask the second question? Is that to me also? Oh, no, that's for uh, Liz, not for Elizabeth. But for, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, a great question. Uh, yeah, actually, this is a this is the problem we have when it comes to deployment. Um, I mean, apart from, of course, uh, other issues with sensors and so on. So, um, yes, it is actually based on prior knowledge and uh, qualitative understanding, I should say, on like, you know, where air quality can be good. Suppose, you know, you have a traffic intersection, um, you know, in which which you know, which periodically sees a lot of jams, and you know, and you know, you have, you you kind of know that you know there is this uh, poor air quality over there, but then there are no monitors in the near in the neighborhood. So some of our locations were chosen because there were monitors in the neighborhood uh, that weren't functioning. Um, so monitoring stations, the public monitoring stations, were not functioning, uh, and others were from you know uh, uh, places where. Uh, uh, you know, that were just empty. You know, we just think, oh, you know, there's such a 10 kilometer gap between these two monitoring stations, you know, we need to put something in between. Uh, and also, you know, there's one more uh, factor and this, this isn't really domain specific. This is just, we need a, a place to host the sensor. So uh, we need a place to actually hook it up and, you know, it need, we need to have access to power and, and so on. So, you know, the, these things. Thank you so much. Appreciate so I'm it. I'm gonna. Sorry, Raul. I'll interrupt before your second question in the interest of time. So please go ahead and put it in the chat, and and Liz can respond to it. Um, but I just wanted to um, close out with um, an opportunity for all four panelists to just share any closing thought that they have, whether it's advice to, to the people out there or or anything. Um, so again, we'll go in order. So Liz, please go ahead. Sure. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for listening, for having me. 
Thank you, Lily, for moderating and Circus for hosting. And uh, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or for further discussion. Uh, thanks again. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Lily, Jackson, and all of uh, all Mill and everyone. Uh, it was it was you know I was glad to be here and you know happy to have got a chance to present my work. And please feel free to reach out. I leave my email in the chat box. Uh, I don't think I responded to Milin's question. So uh, about publication, somehow I missed that. Uh, so I'll just very quickly respond to that. So mostly I've been working in the systems group here at NYU. So I mostly uh, try to publish in systems venues. So uh, that includes both, uh, you know, workshops and also like, you know, uh, bigger venues and systems and also, um, uh, you know, AI for social good venues and workshops. And I think there are a lot of tracks, but then one thing that I've felt was that, you know, there are more of these machine learning venues that actually have AI for social good tracks rather than systems venues. And I think going forward, having uh, AI for social good tracks and systems venues like census and so on, I think would be nice. Um, I, I also wanted to thank uh, the organizers. This is a really great initiative. And um, I guess uh, I wanna stay really positive and I, I feel that there's a big community that's, uh, that's really working towards AI for social good and it, it's really ga gaining momentum. So, I mean, if, uh, if there was an action item, I think it's wherever, whatever institution you're at or whatever country or region, um, try to find people who, who have the, the same goals or who are working to, towards similar um, missions, even from other disciplines uh, that, that you don't necessarily know. And, um, you know, grassroots projects are, are really great and it's a great way of, of building community across the world. Thank you. Great. So a big thank you to the circus and to all of the other panelists. I loved hearing about your work. Um, I guess in concluding remarks uh, is basically the thank you. Uh, echoing everyone else, please reach out to me if you're interested in this space and especially like satellite imagery and machine learning space. Uh, it can be kind of hard to like find the right community to integrate yourself into. And I think Sasha say, saying they do exist and I would echo that, um, but don't hesitate to reach out to people like us to help you find those people that are like connected to you. Um, Cause we all wanna see AI used for social good. That's why we're here. Um, and as this network develops, like let us help you um, find your place in it. Thanks so much, um, wise words from everyone. And I just want to give a little plug. Our next session for this Rising Star series will be on fairness on April 20th. And our final session on tech and society will be the 29th. So hope to see many of you there. And thank you again so much to um, Liz, Shiva, Esther, and Sasha, and all of you for being here. Thank you. And great work to all the other uh, panelists too. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.